how can I have this much in common with Bach? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I I just kept sitting here thinking, wait a minute. He he is expressing all these emotions that, uh, that I have felt, and I would never in my lifetime think of having anything in common with Bach beside the fact that I enjoyed listening to Bach. I mean, but now I, I feel, well, gee, he must have, for some reason, experienced all these various parts of life that I've now experienced. I, at least I had the illusion in my mind that this was, as you said, very elitist music. This was for the few who graduated from these great schools and actually could understand the music. It's not like that. No. Yeah. Uh, it isn't. I mean, I, I, I could sit here and, and, and relate to some of this stuff. And I haven't heard anything about classic music at all. So for people to, to, to put this in some category whereby you need a degree or a PhD or a master's to understand and absorb this, uh, I, I, and I, I think that's the impression that has been created in many circles. And I, I'm, just, I'm just keen that this, uh, that this kind of music get out more. I mean, let, let more people hear it so that this big facade is broken between sure. uh, we as normal mortal human beings and Bach, who said these great things. Well, he said things that reflect life and society, which we can relate to. I was thinking about how music can transcend boundaries and can transcend cultures and like you said, you know, this very diverse group of people and how we could listen to this and have such, uh, I think, a level of connectivity moving along this line here among ourselves. And then I was thinking about how hard it is to do that with language. Johann Sebastian Bach was born in Germany in 1685. Both of his parents died when he was nine years old. Before his first wife died, they had seven children. He married again, and with his second wife had 13 more children. Not all 20 of the children lived to adulthood, but just the size of his family tells us that Bach was a real human being and that his life included more than making music. He was, however, a master musician. He left a legacy of 1,000 compositions. Bach is often thought of as stuffy and understandable only by those trained in classical music. But his music crosses ages and nationalities, ethnicities and cultures to speak powerfully to all of us. In this program, we will explore Bach's timeless messages of peace and hope with Joseph Irwin. Joe is a professional musician and a former faculty member at the Juilliard School of Music. We believe that in a world struggling to awaken from a nightmare of fear, violence, and war, Jack out of the box can bring us healing. Welcome to our visit with one of the world's greatest composers, Johann Sebastian Bach. In this program, we speak of him as Jack. We will seek to understand Jack Bach through his famous work, The Mass in B Minor. As you listen to portions of this music, so too did a group from all walks of life. Some had never heard this music before. Some had never heard of Bach before. But when they listened to Bach, they heard messages that moved them deeply. We invite you to listen and to discover what Jack Bach says to you. From the beginning of recorded time, in my judgment, there have always been a focal point of one person every now and then who speaks through a particular language, out of a particular culture, out of a particular time frame and a geographic location. They speak something that they sense about truth and that word that they utter becomes a permanent fixture in human libraries. And it becomes valuable to generation after generation after generation. 
Our purpose is to get Bach out of the box of architecture and mathematics into the full realm of a full-blown human being with emotions, with muscles, with a head, with a heart, everything, to see if we can't make him more accessible for today's purposes. We want to free Jack from the box that he's in.
it completely fills the heart and the spirit. I, I felt that it was just coming inside and making me feel full of joy um, in a way. It was a little bit sad, but it was a little bit joyous as well. It got kind of got the sense of kind of mournful almost, but it was whatever the words were coming from, they were singing it from how they felt deep down inside from their very soul. Wow. It was just their emotions just pouring out. The way I felt about it was like contending with struggle and rising above it together. Really there is a sense of uh, triumph at the end. Right. It's, it's a crescendo almost. But I think uh, to place that in isolation is, is not fair. I think that just reveals the hardship and the right. pain that has been overcome. So I think you appreciate that more when you say, yes, there was pain and now it's been overcome. I think it's, um, it's more or less it just gives me a feeling of just like celebrating something, yes. celebrating wow. life. It's the revelation you have and you realize that you've got people to support you, you're not by yourself, there's other people in the same boat you are and you can't help but feel this struggle is worth it and I've overcome it with the help of everyone else and now everything will be okay. It reminds me of the way people describe um, the joy of, this sounds strange, but the near-death experiences where people say, it felt so wonderful, I didn't want to come back, you know, and, and it was like, it, it, it uh, really makes you feel that you're rising spiritually into a greater joy.
I think all of this is just an incredible dichotomy. That's the beauty of this. I mean, there is the danger in the background with the music, no doubt about that. And yet there is the calming, soothing voice of the voices in front. And I think that, that, that represents life, I think, that dichotomy. I felt like it was uh, slowly evolving. It's like when you've had that much pain, things don't change that fast. And it's a slow evolution. There was also patience and a gentleness. And I was thinking about the importance of being gentle with ourselves, with our pain, as we're evolving to the next level, as we're transforming. I listened for the security of the voices all the time, and that was the stability. Um, and it kind of the, if, if you're spiritual, it's your spiritual stability in an era of danger or uncertainty. And if you hold to that, then the danger and uncertainty can kind of move over you. You get a, a feeling of being oppressed, being suppressed, you know, down. And then towards the end, it's like you're moving, you know, you, you're rising above that. And you're moving towards a feeling of, of freedom. Uh, open space. When the voices came, I started to feel hope. Hope amidst the danger. Hope amidst the trouble. I started thinking personally about what happens when I, I go through pain and then all of a sudden one day you might be driving along or walking along feeling joyous and it happened all at once without your even realizing it. It's like a celebration of being alive, I think, and uh, it's um, it's like, you know, you've experienced so much of pain and so much of suffering and it's like so beautiful to be back, you know, to be in peace with your, at peace with yourself, to be, to be joyous. For the last three selections of the Mass, we go to depths of suffering and pain. But then we find release and peace. Bach knew incredible stress and pain in his professional and his personal life. He tells us about it in his music. Listening to his turmoil, we connect with Bach the person. He knew how it felt to suffer and to be freed from suffering. He expressed this with clarity and depth in the transition that he makes from the somber music of the crucifixion to the triumphant music of the resurrection. Bach finished writing the Mass in B minor toward the end of his life. The last movement, Dona Nobis Pacem, Grant Us Peace, reflects the inner peace that he found and that we all seek as we journey toward our own finales. But first, listen again to our panel. You know, when I was in the seventh grade, um, junior high school, we were required to take a music appreciation class. And since my name began with a W, Winter, I always got to sit in the back of the class. Yes. <laughs> and I had such a hard time with this class, I used to sit and the clock was right across from where I sat. And what I would do is I would hold my breath and I would see how long I could hold my breath before I had to take a breath. Because yeah. I, this thing was just so confining, this class. My exposure to classical music was through um, fun. My, uh, I remember my dad, who was a music teacher, uh, uh -huh. bought me a box of classical records. Um, it was a huge box. It could have been foreboding, you know, to go and play this, but it had a baton in it. And so I was fascinated by the baton, so I took the baton out, put the classical music on, and I became so wrapped up in it, and I was having so much fun experience, experiencing classical music, which is the difference between the class that you took and what we're talking about here. I've heard this music for the first time this last week on this cassette, and I think far too often, myself included, and students of my age, uh, use music as an escape, as a, as, 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 as a means of getting away from from the day-to-day -day problems and concerns of our life. And I think this, uh, as a change, makes you reflect on life. I mean, it's got all the pain and all the sadness and all the happiness all together, which I experience on a daily basis. Uh, and I think that's why this is so different, because this makes you think about life 
whereas much of other music today uh, is, 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 is an artificial reflection of what you'd aspire to be and that which is not true. How can we take something so powerful and use it more for our own healing, for our own level of connection? So we're not in the back of the classroom holding our breath. How can we make this a, an instrument of, of change as opposed to something that stays in these, these little private chambers? I've been in this country for four years. I haven't been out of my country before that. And I just see that uh, th there's so much difference that's emphasized all over the world. You spoke about Bosnia, about Israel, in any number of parts of the world. And I just think music like this is, is, is one that unites. It's the first time I have about 25 different emotions out here from listening to three minutes of music. And I think this is, this is uh, music that I think that captures emotions of the whole world. It's not localized, it's, it's the language of the world. I think that music is probably the most enduring uh, form of communication because you don't have to understand the language like you said before whether you're in China or India or Russia or Bosnia the musical piece is a musical piece or the expression is expression and it's endured because we had to have something to help us endure the frustrations and the pain and the agony of life and that that uh, sine wave or that that beat that rhythm that up and down his music you can apply to anything, your own life, you can apply to anyone's life and your own problems and you can see the people in his music that he's thinking about going through transformations, going through pain, coming to contentment and happiness and it helps you move through your pain that you're having at that time and that's why he relaxes me so when I have troubles, if I play or listen to Bach, I can see oh there is light, there is hope at the end, I just need to be patient and calm and slow and move through it on my own and then I'll come to that contentment and light this up there. I, I doubt very seriously if uh, in the 17th century or 18th century they called it classical music. I mean it was music. I mean gospel wasn't gospel. It could very well have been. Sure we've, we've made that. We've created those and what we are doing now is just dispelling those boxes and taking things out of the box and looking at them for what they're worth or face value. You know uplifting uh, uh, types of things are uplifting. It doesn't, it doesn't matter you know, if you're going to label it jazz or classical or rock or art or a handshake or love or compassion. If it brings and builds, then it's positive and that's, you know, that's out of the box. Well, I can understand really why some people think Bach belongs up there and he's elitist and doesn't have anything to do with me because musicians like myself have performed it so cleanly and so pristinely as it's written on the page and in the style that we learned was Bach's style that we forget there's rock music style and it's in Bach. There's jazz in Bach. There's blues in Bach. There's country in Bach. But you don't hear that unless you get out of the box of 18th century style and see the flesh and blood of Bach.